Hello there, welcome back to IndyCar. It's the 23rd of May today. Now, you'll see that I've changed the camera angle and until my microphone is fitted to this new phone, uh, you're going to have to put up with my ugly mush a bit closer to the camera just so that you can hear what I'm saying hopefully today. Anyway, this is only a temporary measure and we should be back to normal hopefully tomorrow with the new microphone. Anyway, the subject of today's program is the prospectus for independence which the SNP is currently preparing at the moment as far as I understand it and will be published shortly. This uh, document is intended to, I believe, replace the white paper which was used in 2014 to describe what independence would lead to. Now, the problem I have with the idea of the prospectus is that basically we're giving a new name to the same old thing, which is basically another white paper. This is another document which will be aspirational and will uh, lay out what will be possible with independence. But unfortunately, I don't believe it goes far enough in convincing doubting voters or those ambivalent to independence to come along with us. So, in an effort to be more inclusive, one of the things I think is essential to convincing doubters is to, forgive me, uh, just clear a message from my screen, is to provide some guarantees, some surety. And the only way that you can really do this is to provide a written constitution, albeit a provisional one in this instance, which um, the full implications of which will not be actioned until an independence uh, majority is obtained. Now, the first thing to say about this is that um, all major republics, countries which have seceded from the United Kingdom and many which uh, have seceded from other places have written constitutions. And what these do is they describe exactly what the rights and responsibilities and the restrictions on power are for politicians, for citizens and organisations and businesses. And what that does is it guarantees that certain things will happen. Not just vague promises or pledges and not just aspirations for things which might happen, but things which will definitely happen because they are binding. In other words, acceptance of a written constitution uh, at Holyrood would bind these um, obligations in Scots law. So any government which uh, came to power after independence or even while independence is being achieved must abide by the conditions of this constitution. Now, to be fair to the SNP, I have heard directly from Mike Russell, in fact, that Elliot Bulmer, who is um, a noted constitutional expert, has been tasked by the SNP with pre preparing such a provisional constitution. However, it hasn't been published yet and there doesn't seem to be any sign of it and no press releases or anything else have been issued by the party explaining what it is or when it might appear. This is a bit of a shame really because they seem to be missing the boat quite considerably with this. However, um, let me press on. The prospectus for independence is expected to contain the SNP's plans for what will happen after an independence vote and presumably um, what it plans to do if it is still in office after an independence referendum success. As I said, the problem is that many people who work in the United Kingdom have come here from elsewhere in the UK. And they've come here working either for British companies, for the British state, for the Department of Defence, for, you know, for, from the point of view of uh, the judiciary, or from other organisations which have strong links to the United Kingdom. And they feel, perhaps rightly, that their positions in these companies would be threatened if Scotland became independent. However, these things can be guaranteed. And in fact, any citizen in a country which is seceding can have all of their rights guaranteed in such a constitution. And this would include things like the right to dual citizenship in order to uh, assuage people's fears that they would be completely separating from the rest of the United Kingdom. We could point out that their rights as uh, British citizens to maintain a British passport would be preserved for as long as they wished. They could hold dual nationality if they wished and that the common travel area in the United Kingdom would remain in perpetuity under Scots law and that would allow everybody in Scotland to cross the border into England or any other part of the United Kingdom without acquiring a passport. And this is something which already exists, but it would be nice to see written into a constitution. 
A provisional constitution can also describe the method by which the Scottish Parliament would go about actually um, securing independence politically, the form of negotiation that would take place, when it would happen, who would be involved, who would negotiate, and how the British government would be dealt with. Now, all of these things can be put in a prospectus, obviously, but a prospectus is a wish list. As far as I know, there has never been a political prospectus like this ever. In fact, the word prospectus, if you look it up in the dictionary, is used to describe um, courses in universities or colleges, and it's sometimes used uh, to provide uh, business investors with accurate information on the performance of a limited company. <clears throat> but I've never seen it used in respect to a political uh, and national referendum of this kind, which involves the constitutional future of Scotland. I've mentioned a few times, and a lot of historians will already know this, that Scotland's only representation in Westminster, which has the power to actually repeal the Acts of Union, are the 46 SNP and ALBA MPs who are currently sitting in Westminster because they are the representative government of Scotland sitting in the Westminster Chamber alongside the English government. And this has always been the case. The Scottish Parliament in exile, if you like, is what is sitting in England. And they are the only ones who have the constitutional power to repeal the Acts of Union in Scotland because they are the elected representatives to the British Parliament and Scotland's role within it. So technically speaking, it is they who would have to come north after the referendum and to put forward a bill which repeals the Acts of Union and the Treaties of Union. In other words, Scotland wouldn't have to formally withdraw. These things can be set out in a provisional constitution as well. This is the mechanics of separating uh, Scotland's government from that of Westminster. Now remember, there are only three powers which remain to be fully transferred. Devolution provides Scotland with enough powers to run its own affairs, but not enough to protect itself in terms of defence, not enough uh, to make its own decisions about foreign policy and trade, and not enough for it to actually do trade deals with other countries either. So there are a number of things which would need to come back to the Scottish Parliament. Those would have to be detailed in the Constitution as well. But having written the Constitution, which guarantees the rights of every citizen in Scotland, wherever in the United Kingdom they have come from, would go a long way to answering all of the major uh, questions and the objections from people who've come to Scotland from other places during the last uh, referendum. They naturally believed the British government when it said that they wouldn't be able to use their British passports, they would be forced to have a Scottish nationality, they wouldn't be in the European Union, they wouldn't be able to use the pound, and you know the rest of the story. However, in a constitution, when it is written, it is a binding document, and if adopted by Holyrood before the referendum, then the Holyrood Parliament would be obliged by law to do all of the things in that constitution. And that would be protecting the rights of these people who've come to Scotland, safeguarding their jobs and their positions, not disadvantaging them, not discriminating against them, also guaranteeing that Scotland would seek to either uh, rejoin the European Union eventually, or in the interim, as a, perhaps a, a a temporary measure to join the European Free Trade Association so that we can open up trade and to guarantee the rights and the responsibilities of every individual here, but also to circumscribe the powers of the Scottish state. In other words, what the elected officials and the government of Scotland are allowed to do. And also, I think, to enshrine forever in the, um, in the laws of Scotland that Scottish people are sovereign and it is they who can decide whether a government should be uh, removed or whether a, a first minister or prime minister, whichever you want to call it, can be impeached or removed from power and what the circumstances have to be for that to happen. All of these things would give concrete guarantees to anyone who's come to Scotland from elsewhere that the Scottish state will treat them in the way that they expect. And this, I think, is the only way that we can truly uh, bring people on board who normally would have thought of themselves as British and would have worried about the fact that they think that Scotland is separating, that their money won't be uh, able to be used in Scotland anymore. All of these things could be written into the Constitution before the vote so that no one is in any doubt 
and so that nobody uh, on the British side of things can say, oh, but that's not going to happen. Because in Scots law, whatever is decided and whatever is enshrined in a bill, if it's passed in the Parliament of Holyrood into Scots law, it instantly becomes a law. Anyone not following it would be breaking the law and acting unlawfully, could be impeached, could be fined or imprisoned. And under this system, we would not have politicians who are above the law, like they have in England, who whenever they do anything wrong, when they lie, commit fraud, uh, or commit crimes of any kind, they can't get off with it. Um, this would provide a country which has, tran uh, has a transparent uh, form of government, and where no government official, however high up the chain, is immune from prosecution. With these kinds of rules, with them written into law before the referendum date, everyone in Scotland is sure of what independence will mean, including the currency, including the central bank. These things should not just be pledges, these should be the rules by which the new state is governed. And as I've said many times, the only way to guarantee all of this is with a written constitution. And there are three of them already in existence, none of which has ever been published, none of which has ever been discussed in the Chamber of Holyrood. For what reason, I know not. Elliot Bulmer still has not produced his constitution. We have no idea whether it's ever going to appear. And I am not holding my breath, frankly, about whether it will appear in time for the referendum next year. However, we have the referendum coming up next year. We are assured it's going to happen. We believe, we have to believe that it will happen. But the only way to win it, if we are using the same demographics and the same franchise as last time and the same question as last time, is to put beyond doubt all of the things that were questioned in 2014. The SNP needs to learn from the mistakes of 2014 and not repeat them. And that means putting them to bed. Every single objection made by Better Together needs to be dealt with in the Constitution and removed as a point of argument. Because if we do this, then there will be no objections possible by anybody in the Better Together camp that will hold any water at all. Because once something is a law in Scotland, then it happens. And this, uh, I'm afraid, is my view. It remains to be seen whether the SNP listens to people like me who are sitting in a car, uh, perhaps not an elected official, not got a formal qualification in politics or political science. But I do know a lot of people who are experts in this field, and many of them have gone to the enormous trouble of doing years of academic research in writing suitable constitutions for the new restored Scotland. Because this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about separating ourselves from anyone. We're talking about restoring the sovereignty of Scotland and giving the people who have that sovereignty the right to give their trust to their own Scottish government. In other words, to imbue that sovereignty in our own parliament and full sovereignty at that. Control over every aspect of the physical world of Scotland, every resource, every mountain, every glen, the air around us, the seas around us. All aspects of Scotland need to be under our control, fully restored. And that is what independence is. It's the restoration of Scotland as it was before 1707 and before it was forced into what has become an abusive marriage to a much larger and more belligerent and greedy nation down south. So I guess that's the end of my rant for today. I hope you've been able to hear me a bit better since I'm actually sitting about literally a foot from the phone. Um, anyway. I'll be back again tomorrow, hopefully further away from the screen next time, so you won't have to put up with my face in enormous detail as you have today. In the meantime, there is a poll, uh, I hope, on this current uh, broadcast. If you're interested in taking part, please have a go. But I'd be interested to know everybody's views on written constitutions, because I think, personally, that the written constitution is the answer to the reasons we failed in 2014. It's the only answer because there is no other way of guaranteeing that all of the things that the SNP will say in its prospectus will actually happen. And it guarantees the rights of every individual from every country who's come to become a Scot. And that is very important, especially for our English friends, friends from Wales, Ireland, Northern Ireland, those from Europe, and those from further afield who've chosen Scotland to be their, their country, their home. 
And if that's the case, then they know what they're voting for and nothing that is said by the British government or the rabid right-wing British press can do anything to unstick that legal constitution. It's guaranteed, it's set in stone. And let's face it, it's worked for America, it's worked for many other countries, and it limits government. It stops them becoming autocracies, which is what the United Kingdom has now become under Boris Johnson. We're about to see many restrictions on our freedoms to, uh, to protest. We are seeing restrictions on the people who can come and go. We are seeing very racist um, foreign policies. And we are seeing a lot, of, a lot of law breaking, which is going unchallenged by the politicians in Westminster. So I think we have the opportunity here, and it's one opportunity to make sure we do this right. And I hope uh, that the SNP listens to bloggers like me who support independence, who want the referendum to work, believe and trust that the SNP will provide it. But I think that they're going about the, uh, the business of convincing doubters the wrong way at the moment. Anyway, that's it from me today. Hopefully I'll see you again tomorrow. In the meantime, again, keep your chins up, keep the faith, and remember, make your feelings known to your own MSPs and your own MPs, because the one thing that they can't ignore is their own constituents. And let's face it, we Scots, people who live here, are the ones with the sovereignty, and it is we who decide what our politicians should do. And that's what the Constitution would guarantee. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.